what we are able to do in this report is the first systematic assessment of uh, globalization in terms of economic inequality. And what we show here, uh, one of the main results is that despite high growth in emerging countries, uh, and this growth actually is very often used to, uh, to argue for a reduction in global inequality. Well, we see uh, an increase in global inequality, and this increase uh, can be uh, very much expressed in one single line, uh, which is that the top 1% captured twice as much global growth. So that is all new uh, rupees, yuan, euros, dollars, uh, the new dollars generated, and all the new money, all the new cash created, generated since uh, 1980. Well, the top 1% captured twice as much growth as the bottom 50% combined. Here it's a snapshot in 2016, where you see uh, the share of national income captured by the 10% richest uh, in, in each country. Uh, in Europe, the top 10% captured 37% of national income. In the Middle East, 61%. And then you have a diversity of, of, uh, of positions. So India is close to the top, 55%. China, 41%, USA, Canada, 47%. So this is the picture today. Where do we come from? So let's look at the evolution since 1980. So again, we look at the top 10% income share. We look at India in yellow, USA, Canada, so North America in blue, Russia in purple, China in red, Europe in uh, green. And we see these uh, diverging trajectories since 1980. So low level of inequality at the beginning of the period, high level of inequality at the end, but this really the trajectory is really varied. So if you look at, for instance, Russia, so most equal country in 1990 during the, the Soviet period, and then in just five years, it became actually the most unequal country in, in this subset. So a very brutal shift out, uh, out of, uh, of uh, the, the Soviet uh, economy. Now, if you look at uh, China and India, for instance, you see in both cases a rise in inequality, but much more moderate in China, especially at the end of the period. <coughs> I will come back on that. And then if you compare USA, uh, Canada, and Europe, you also see a very similar inequality level in 1980 and a very, very different uh, position at the end uh, of the period. If we take a step back and put these... Uh, relatively short-term or mid-term uh, evolutions in a broader historical perspective. Well, we see that all these countries uh, went through from 1950 broadly to uh, the early 1980s uh, in a low inequality phase. We're back in a rising inequality phase, so there was a dec decreasing phase, back to a rising phase. Well, here I'm adding three more regions to the graph. So I'm adding the Middle East at the top here, Brazil also at the top, Sub-Saharan Africa at the top, which are arguably re regions which never uh, went through this compression phase of inequality, whether a communist uh, regime, Soviet regime, highly regulated economy regime, or mixed economy regime in the US or Europe. These re regions arguably always had uh, a very high level of inequality. Unfortunately, we don't have at the moment enough data uh, for the the, the longer historical period. But you see that they, they seem to set uh, what we could call a, a high inequality frontier, in the sense that levels of inequality in these regions is so high that it, it is actually hard to go even higher, in terms at least uh, as defined by the top 10% income share. And some countries seem to be back to these extreme levels of inequality. So now that we've looked at these different building bricks uh, of uh, our global distribution of income, let's look at all world individuals. So let's break the boundaries of countries. Let's just look at individuals uh, just with uh, the, their income levels. So and here we sort world citizens from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right. So we have a hundred group of, of individuals here. And uh, so this is a population scale. So we, we, we attribute to each group of equal po population size. So here you have 10% of the world population, here 10%, 10%. So they represent 10% of the axis, 10% of the axis, 10% of the axis. So they are scaled by population. What we do on the, on the y-axis is that we plot the real income growth rates over the period. And this is our global elephant curve. So basically, you see at the bottom among the poorest group here of the global income distribution, the rise of emerg emerging countries with a total growth rate over the period so from 1980 to 2016, 
over 100%. In the middle of the distribution or second half, you see growth rates that are much lower, so below 50%. So these are the squeezed bottom 90% in the US and in Western Europe. And actually, we look at uh, the case of the US in more detail. In the US, the bottom 50% actually grew at close to 0% of the period. So it can go actually much lower than 50%. And then if you go to the top of the global distribution, you see very high income growth rates, over 200% uh, for the very top groups. Now one may uh, raise uh, an important question, which is, uh, does, it, does it really matter? to have very high income growth rates here. In fact, by definition, the top 1% is just a very small group of people. <coughs> Perhaps they have very high income growth rate at the individual level, but this doesn't matter much from a macroeconomic perspective. Perhaps it's just a small share of the cake that they captured. So we assess, we try to answer this question with, the, with this graph, which is the same data, okay? The only difference is that we, uh, we sought uh, we represent here individuals on a different uh, scale. So it's still the poorest on the left, the richest on the right. The difference here is that we give each group of a given population size a length that is proportional to, to the total share of growth that it captured over the period. Okay, so look at the, the top 1%. So every, everyone on the left on, of uh, 99, they represented just one dot here. They would be, they would be right here, just one dot. Here they represent 27% of the axis because they captured 27% 20 per, of total growth over the period. So here we, we, we scale by, by the share of growth captured. Now let's look at the bottom 50%. The bottom 50%, half of the world population, captured only 12% of total growth over the period. So that's two times more for the top 1% than for the bottom 50%. So answer to uh, the question I, I raised before, does it really matter? Yeah, in terms of macroeconomic growth, it is a substantial amount of growth captured, of income growth captured by the top 1%. So uh, in fact, you know, squeezing half of the world population on the left-hand side of this graph is not necessarily the best way to represent uh, the importance in terms of population of, of this group, group. So we prefer to adopt a mixed representation. So in this graph, graph I, I'm mixing the, the two previous graphs. So we're giving uh, some, you know, some, some space for the bottom 50% to be able to, to really see here uh, the importance in terms of population size. But we're also stretching the top 1% to show the importance in terms of the share of growth it captured. So this is one of the benchmark, the key result of this, of this report, our uh, so-called global uh, elephant curve of uh, inequality and growth. This, this uh, elephant curve of inequality and growth, in fact, comes from two curves. The addition of two, uh, so to say, COBRA curves. So here is the same curve, but just for US, Canada, and Western Europe. The poorest on the left, the richest on the right. Uh, we see here that growth rate move, on, move from zero to 400, a bit more than 400%. Most of the income uh, distribution, so 80% of the population grows below 50%, 30, 40%. And then when you go up to the top, you see very important growth rates, uh, over 40% for the very top groups. So this is Western Europe and US Canada. Same, same graph, but for China and India. So the, the first big difference here is what you see on the y-axis. So we, we don't stop at 400% anymore, but 4,000% growth rate that were much higher. But more or less, it's the same general pattern. It's, we still have a, a cobra, so to say, with a very extreme growth rate at the top and a much lower growth rate at the bottom, even though uh, these, these, matter, these matter a lot uh, at the bottom. Uh, you see that growth rate were uh, between 100% and 800% for uh, the bottom 80% of the, of the population. I'll come back on that. But our global F1 is actually the combination of these two COBRAs. So when you, when you combine uh, that kind of curve for a low income region and this curve for a high income region, then this is when you get, this is when you get uh, the, the, the elephant. And here, this, this elephant is just for China, India, USA, Canada, and Western Europe. It's a bit different than the one that I presented before. 
Why? Because growth was higher in China and, and India than in other emerging countries. So when we add other emerging countries, this value here that's around 250% is reduced. And this is when you have this, uh, this final result here of, uh, that, that I presented before.